You know, we concluded uh, last year, coming out 2020, with a growing understanding in the knowledge of kingdom authority. Kingdom authority. We've been understanding various different pillars and principles within the kingdom itself. But as we concluded, as we concluded the year, we're, we're uh, endeavoring to understand our role and how to respond in the area of authority. Authority, which is a very foundational principle, literally, it's literally a cornerstone, a chief cornerstone within the knowledge of the kingdom structure itself. We have to understand this, you know, and I know I, I grew in that enlightenment of that study as such. Because it's one thing to walk in the kingdom, it's another thing to walk um, with wisdom and understanding of the kingdom. Understanding of authority. That's very innate. Again, a principle, a uh, cornerstone of the kingdom's culture. Today, I'm going to open up a new study. Another one that's addressing uh, a key foundational principle within the kingdom structure. The kingdom structure. This title of this new study that God would have us to endeavor to, to undertake and to grow in, it's entitled The Wall of Power. A Wall of Power. Rabbi, what do you mean by that? That's what this lesson is about to endeavor. Get it so that we can understand what I'm talking about when I speak in terms of this wall of power. Within that structure, the title of today's study is going to be Faulty Reasoning. Faulty Reasoning. So you might notice that I used the word structure, or like a building. Uh, in, the, in this opening di um, dialogue, I, when I said, when I started speaking about the kingdom structure, see that word structure, that's a, that's a key word. Talk about the structure as building. Because it refers to such as well. That's how God refers to us in, in text, in scripture. So I'm talking about over in Ephesians. Over in Ephesians 22, 20 and 22, it says this. You have been built on the foundation of the emissaries or the apostles or the apostles and the prophets, with the cornerstone being Yeshua, Hamashiach, in union with him, the whole building is held together. And it is growing into a holy temple in union with the Lord. Yes, in union with him. You yourselves are being built together into a spiritual dwelling place for God. God looks upon us as a structure, this, this building, this edifice. We talk about this, this earthly vessel that contains his holy presence. But he speaks in terms of this, of this structure, this building. <laughs> I use the term structure because every building has um, a load-bearing wall. See, so we stand inside this building. If I was to come over here to this wall, and I'd be anxious, I mean, if, if I was anxious or interested in taking down this wall so I can get it to the other side, I'd run into major problems. You know why? Because, you know, this is not an internal wall, this is this is a, a load-bearing wall. It supports this frame. It supports this edifice. It holds the weight of the structure that we're in. They call it, in uh, architectural terms or in building terms, they call it a load-bearing wall. Hmm. That load-bearing wall, it's a wall that, again, that sustains the weight of this building, this edifice, <laughs> and holds it in place. That wall, or these load-bearing walls, is critical. 
It's a critical wall within the structure and within the whole understanding as they start stepping into this kingdom structure, this load-bearing wall. See, this wall is so critical. This is what Yeshua himself came, when he came to earth, to restore and to redress within us. When he, as he walked earth, I'm going to try to understand, what was his mission? What was his focus? I mean, I know he came to redeem us, to save us, but I mean, it's all in so many pieces and components that something big happened up in, the, up in glory, which caused Yeshua to step in himself in order to, to bring his people back into a line with a thought. And so as I started thinking about that, I'm trying to think, what all was he doing? What was his mission? What was he trying to achieve? What was his goal? And, uh, and, and uh, Abba allowed me to understand. He says, understand the weight of a load-bearing wall. Something transpired. Understand the, understand the seriousness and the criticalness and the complexity of what a load-bearing wall is. Hmm. Yeshua, when he walked to earth, when he came to earth, he himself, he came to address that specific fact, to restore something that's transpired within that barren wall. And this barren wall, I use this, I'm speaking of it somewhat uh, as an analogy to understand, if we can understand the weight of it in the natural, it's a, it's a spiritual analogy, because I'm speaking of a heavenly principle that is so critical, that's low barren, a, a heavenly principle that's so critical in its nature, that it's undoing, that it's undoing resulted in the fall of a third of the heavenly host. Hmm. And upon his fall to earth, Satan loosed the same corrupt ideology on earth and it resulted in the fall of all humanity. All fell from the same plot, the same goal, for something that was foundational, something that was supportive, something that's bearing weight to a, to a structure. God in his word, and we just spoke about, he says, we are built on the foundation. Something had to come in, something weakened. And God wants us to understand that weakening aspect of what that was. He said, because what that was, if we don't understand, we'll find our legs getting knocked out again and again and again. In fact, we'll find ourselves doing it continually. Being still affected by this weight of this wall, of this piece, of this structure that was holding the foundation in place when it was, when it was uh, knocked loose. Again, that understanding, that knowledge, it was so devastating, you, you, it'll get you to wonder, I, and what I used to do it over and over, what did he say? What could, what could Hasatana do that can pull a third of the heavenly host? They're standing in glory, and you're thinking of your mind, they're there. What dialogue, what was in place? That shook the foundation and pulled a third of the heavenly host. And then when Hasatan and Satan himself, Lucifer, wham, hit the earth and said he's bringing that same damnable ideology, that same way of thinking, that same thought, that same process to earth. And in, and in doing so, it caused the whole downfall of all man. God says within every structure there's a, a low-bearing wall, something that's supporting. That's what he will have us to talk on. That's what God wants us to understand as we go along with this study. This study is all about addressing that low-bearing wall. Getting us to understand this peace. So the question comes back to us, well, then what was this, Rabbi, what was this foundational wall that was damaged in the fall? What was this wall? What would you, how would you define this wall that was so huge, so massive, 
so key and so pivotal to bring about such destruction. Again, if I went over this wall, you know, every engineer and every, every builder would tremble because, you know, we moved into an old home and uh, I literally, Roberto helped me. We remodeled this whole house. We changed rooms, inner walls, rooms where there were closets or there's a bedroom or there's a hallway. I can okay, knock it out into widened rooms and create another space. As I was knocking out walls, they looked at me to tell me, said, you can take that one out, you can take that one out, you can't touch that one. You can take this one out, but you can't touch this one. This one will damage everything. You knock that off if you want to, and you better run. So if I happen to come over here right now because I want to get, have a quick way to get to that hallway on the opposite side, and I start with a sledgehammer and stuff, start knocking this wall out, contractors or builders or people with building knowledge will be trembling. Because you know there's beams and everything that's going through this place and they're being supported. <laughs> but what was this foundation wall that was damaged in the fall? If they did such, it was echoed in one word. That word is immuna. Hebrew word, immuna. A word rendered in English as faith or belief. Hebrew is the word immunah. We translate it as faith or belief, a foundational structure. It's this word immunah, this faith, belief, it finds its root in the word aman. That word aman means secure trust or to rely on. Something firm, something foundation. Secure trust. Something that's relied on, that you can hold on to. Foundational. From this word aman is where we get the word Amen. In our prayer and our fascination and our understanding, as we speak and talk about the glory of God and stuff, we'll say, when we start talking about God's word, I'll say, God says such and such, such and such, and you'll say, Amen. For sure. It's firm. It's unmovable. That's true. It's truth. This word, immunah, in its essence, means a steadfastness in the commands of God. It means a steadfastness, a surety, a firm resolve in the commands of God. It means a trust grounded in obedience. Speaking in terms of, 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 of passing faith or just trying to say, do you have faith? We all have a faith. God speaks in terms of this. But what we're talking about here, something transpired that can shake you at your core. Huh. He says it's a steadfastness in the commands of God a trust grounded in obedience. And literally, this word immunah is embodied in what we call the Shema. To hear and obey. See, it's one thing when I go to speak, everyone can say, Yeah, I can see, I can, I'm sitting in the back of the building, but I can hear rabbis speak from back here. I can hear him. I mean, I fully comprehend. And we did a lot of in depth study on Shema, it's more than just hearing. It's hearing, comprehending, understanding, and responding. 
in your eye. We start speaking in terms again, take it back into heaven. What was the angel? What was all glory? What shook their faith that caused a third of them to fall? Something had to come in to a point that was implanted within them, but it was damaged. Something transpired when Hasatan hit the earth because that same, again, that same ideology, that same methodology, that same thinking was unloosed upon the earth in a dialogue with Eve. And all humanity fell. It was this load-bearing wall, this structure, this essence that Satan targeted when he had his conversation with Eve. We see it as a simple dialogue, but even the thoughts when he came forth and said, did God say, or what are you doing? You know, as he's speaking terms to challenge, he's looking at the foundation because at this point, Adam and Eve they had no fear. They had no doubt. They were perfectly aligned with God. They were trust grounded, linked, firm, aligned. And when Hasatan was able to remove or to damage or to shake that foundation, something else entered into them into the whole equation, and we'll talk more in depth on this a, 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 a little, little bit later, not today, but a little bit later. Something else entered for the first time, something that Adam and Eve never knew, never experienced, never understood. It was non-existent until you damaged the load-bearing wall. What entered in? Fear. Doubt. See, when Abba showed up fresh with Adam, the wall being damaged, and he said, Adam, where are you? He says, we heard your voice for the first time, and we hid ourselves because we were afraid. This entered in as part of the whole manifestation of a damaged wall. Hmm. What is Immunah? When I speak of it, I said it's translated as faith. It's translated as a belief. But what is it? Immunah, what it is, it's an innate or an inherent belief or conviction. Something that's born within, something that's planted within, it's inherent. We said that God is love. He's inherent. God is authority. He's inherent. He's built within it. He is it. Immuna speaks in terms of an innate or an inherent belief. Something that was a positive. See, it's a perception of truth that transcends Reasoning. It's a perception of truth that transcends all reasoning. It's a pure and a precious gift, a pure and a precious sustaining gift placed by God within each of us. We all have it. You know, we see it in scripture, we'll see it and we'll, and we'll fly past it. When, God, when the guy says, well, says, he says, God, you know, sure ask him, he says, do you believe? He says, Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. See, I have faith, I have belief, but, but some, it's weakened, something's wrong, just help my unbelief. We have doubt, we talk about, we have faith. Yeshua says, if you have faith like that of a mustard seed, do you believe? Yes, oh yeah, I believe. You remember my, I shared that story about the guy on the tightrope? I talked about that guy on the tightrope strung out over up in Niagara Falls and he's walking. I 
And I says, he goes, why is God looking at him? Trying says, he says, I'm God looking and says, wow, I can't believe you did that. And I said, yeah, I can do that. He said, do you, you think I can do that going backwards? And I said, shoot, shoot. Going backwards, he said, yeah. So the guy's sticking. And he starts walking backwards. And the guy on the other side goes like this. Oh, my God. He gets to the other side. And just walk. Ta-da. And the guy says, incredible. Awesome. I can't believe you did that. He said, yeah. He said, you think I can do this by pushing a wheelbarrow across? The guy said, you're going to push a wheelbarrow? Yeah, I'm going to put down the balancing stick and I'll push this wheelbarrow across. I said, shoot. I can't believe this. The guy said, he grabs a wheelbarrow. He says, he starts going across. And the guy said, oh my. He said, gets another sign. Ta da! And the guy said, unreal. You're awesome. I can't believe that. The guy said, you think I can do it and go back? He said, oh, shoot. I didn't see him walk backwards. I see him walk forward. I see him push a wheelbarrow. Yeah, you can do it. I know you can do it. He says, you believe I can do it? He said, yeah. He said, get in. And the guy said, oh. Now, that changed. Now, I can believe you can go across, but I don't believe me getting that wheelbarrow and you pushing me. Changed. Structure your belief. That says we all have faith, we all have a belief. Even the devils believe. It's placed in them. I mean, I obey. He said, but they believe and they tremble that he is God. Hmm. We all have belief. Something that's been placed in each of us, an innate thing that's been placed within each of us. This is what I think, I believe, is sure and sure is coming to earth. Dealing with this. But so, check out this. See, what was Yeshua's response when he came to earth? You know, to fulfill this mission. Scripture speaks of his response over and over as we walk through the scripture and starts talking about what was his response as he watched this, this inward gift, this innate gift, this precious gift from places then that had been corrupted. We sit in text over and over. As you sure walks, he says this. We've seen one example over Mark 5, 6. six I'm, I'm sorry, 6, 5 or 6, it says this. Yeshua was doing all these miracles. I'm going to summarize. Yeshua was doing all these miracles. They said, but we, and, he, and fame was going out about what he was doing. He said, and he went back home to his hometown, back to Nazareth. And when he goes back to his hometown, although all the people have seen all this transpired, when he goes back to his hometown, it says this, and because of their unbelief, because they were thinking like, who is this? They're talking about him like he's some great prophet or he's the Mashiach or the Messiah or the anointed one. But isn't this the one that, don't we know his brothers, Joes and, and his sisters and, and Mary's right over here? We've seen this, this guy grow up. And because of the commonality and because of what they've seen, because of what they saw, I mean, he said, so their, their belief, their faith wavered. And as the faith wavered, he says, and he said, because of their unbelief, he couldn't do any miracles among them. Their unbelief was shutting them down because they didn't want to receive. He said, he couldn't do any miracles among them except to place his hands on a few sick people and heal them. And what was Yeshua's response? Because he knew that all power stood before them. He had the, you know, when he told Mary, and he told Martha, when he told him, says, when Lazarus died, I know if you had been here, he wouldn't die. He looked at him and says, he, he, he shall rise again. Well, yeah, I, I know he's going to rise again. And they fell into their doctrinal thinking, into their religious way of thinking. And they're trying to say, I know he'll rise again on the last day. 
Because, you know, that's what the text teaches us. That's, I, we know this. And then he kind of rocked the world a little bit. He looked at Martha and said, I am the resurrection. Now she, had to get, she had to wrap her mind around that a bit. He said, you, you're looking for an event. You're looking for a thought. You're looking for a time. But who's the creator of all time? Who is the event? Who is the one that's going to raise? You know he's going to raise, but who does it? And then Shulker says, I am the resurrection. And in doing so, he says, move the stone. See, he says, but he was amazed in his own hometown at what? At their unbelief, at their immuna. Damaged, weakened, corrupted, polluted. You see in that story over there, it says over Mark 5, 35 and, 30, uh, 35 and 36, it speaks in terms of that story that we've seen with the woman with the issue of blood. And she had come up behind Yeshua to touch him. But see, there's part of the story in between there, it says as she's come up behind him, Yeshua's already on the direction going with a, with a key leader in the community. He's the leader of the synagogue, of the Sanhedrin, I mean, of the synagogue. As he went, as he's going there, they said his name is Jairus. And Yeshua turned, that woman, and she touched him. He turned to, to acknowledge that she had been healed because she had spoken within herself. We know the story. But then it says in this story, Jairus, who had Yeshua coming with him because of his weakened, because of his corrupted, his damaged immuna. He believed that Yeshua had to be right with him in order to do it. Come with me. He wasn't like the centurion. Come with me. Because my daughter's right at the point of death. And then why Yeshua stops him and he's dealing with this woman with the issue. And then this text picks up here that says, while he was still speaking, he was speaking to the woman, these people had come up to him and said, while he was still speaking to, speaking to her, messengers arrived from the home of Jairus. And they told him, your daughter is dead. There's no trouble. There's no use troubling the master any longer. Don't worry about dealing with the teacher. He's, waiting, he's taking too long. It's too late. See, it's one thing to deal with them before death which is what he's dealing with, Mary and Lazarus. When he looked at him, and says, I am. See, the same thing's happened here. They come up to him right in the middle of the crowd, people all around him, and, and people come to him and says, and, it's, and it's said, they're talking to Jairus, and Yeshua overhears them, and they're saying, no, you trouble to teach you no more. Your daughter's dead. That's what this is saying. And then Yeshua just looked at Jairus. He says this, but Yeshua overheard them and said to Jairus, don't be afraid. Just have him you now. See, he knew that he had it because he had just enough to come and get Yeshua. But now that him you now that had been corrupted, that had been weakened, that had been diluted, was just flattened when they came and said, it's too late, he's, she's dead. And all thing. Yeshua said, just have him you now. And we know from there, he went to the house and brought that child back. We see it again as Yeshua's walking. Again, he's dealing with all these areas, dealing with him you now and the effect it had on earth and how it troubles us. Over in Matthew 14, it says, it says, when that storm arose, now here he's walking around with his disciples all this time. He's teaching them. He's feeding them. He's showing them. They're watching make the loaves and feed the thousands. They're watching as he's healing the leopards and healing the blind people. They, they, they know him. And as, as they walk with him, they, just like when Yeshua made the comment to Peter, he said, who do men say that I am? He said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. Thou art the Mashiach. In other words, you are the son of God. If you're the son of God, you can do anything. That's what he said. And Yeshua stopped him because in the midst of his, of his proclamation, he tried to say, flesh and blood didn't give that to you. 
What you just got was a download from heaven. That wasn't shared among the people. Blessed are you, Simon, by Jonah, for flesh and blood and give it to you by my Father in heaven. Now, upon this principle, I'm going to build something. So now, they walk with them. They see all this transpiring. They go across this, this, this sea, across the Galilee, because Yeshua has sent them ahead. And this storm rose up, and all that they believed and all that they thought was challenged. You get in this thing, and they, and they make their living on this water. When that storm came up, they thought they saw death. We're doing everything, and this water and this storm is not ceasing. We're going to die out here. <laughs> you know, I, I love it when we take a, a, um, a journey to Israel. And I take people over and we'll cross the, the sea. I want them to see it. I want them to feel it. See, this, this, this is not Gray's Lake, and this is not, you know, the river down here. I want them to get on the sea. I said, this is where it transpired. Now, the sea was much bigger than that. It, it has been evaporated, but it's much bigger. But it's big enough for them to see. And I want them to get on the boat. As we ride on the boat, uh, the way, the, the, way the, uh, the journey is structured, or the people, do, when they cross the Sea of Galilee, they, they can do it in an hour. When we very first went over, we took an hour. But as I was sharing, I wanted people to feel the power of what we were at. I wanted to extend this. So instead of an hour, I told myself I want two hours. So they get on the boat and we're going across, we're going to take two hours to journey from one side of the Galilee to the next. And, and, and again, Galilee is much smaller than it was when Yeshua walked. And as we journey across, we're worshiping, we're watching, we're praising, and then I want them to stop. As we stop, I tell the people, I says, I want you to look out and look at the land. Look at where we're at. And so the people are looking out. They're trying to watch the shoreline, and they can see the hills. And they're watching the expanse as to where they're at. Because I want them to get the feel of it. I started researching more in the, into the archaeology and the lay of the story. You know, it's one thing for me to tell them to feel it, to see where you're at. But it's another thing to get some more facts behind where you're at. Historians speak in terms of said, when Yeshua come walking to them across that water, he had walked three miles across that sea. He didn't walk from here even I would think it's something if you walk 500 feet or, you know, a mile. It said he walked in the storm three miles across. And when I tell the people, I said, I want them to say, I said, as they look out in the sea, I said, now think in terms, look at the shore. Now, if you sure can walk that mount, that distance to come to you, come to them, what will you think he's going to do for you? What's going to hold him? What's going to stop him? Three miles, he's walking. As he comes upon them, they see him, in fact, with the distance like it is. Fear, that, that offset, that, that, that part that came, that was introduced, where Emuna was damaged. Fear overtook them when they saw him. They said, when they saw him, their mind said they thought he was a ghost. They thought he was dead because of myths of, of, of merchants and people dying on seas and stuff. They said he had to be a spirit because there ain't no person on earth. He's not walking on land. He's walking on the water. And it says he's walking on the water. You know, it's not like he's walking on the water and he's in like a little space tube like this, just walking here all in place. You know, just coming at them. No, it says his garments are moving, so they can see that he's in the elements. His hair is moving, and they can tell he's in the elements. Rain is coming, but nothing's hindering him. His eyes are focused on them. As he's walking toward them. They think he's a ghost. And he told them, he says, fear not, it is I. And Peter 
looked at him and was amazed, loved him. And then he turned around and said, you know, with that in your nine that's inside him, when he seen him, he knew what Yeshua can do. And, and then all the message, he turned around and he, that little in your nine, that little flame jumped up and started, hmm. Now he's, he's, he's emboldening. He's gifted. And he looks at Yeshua and says, if that's you, bid me to come to you on the water. And that's seen Yeshua look at him and turn and says, okay, I'll tell you what you do. Hold on to the side and get yourself all anchored in. Don't stand up. Make sure you don't fall out. And when you get on there, make sure you put one foot first and do it. No. All he said to him was, come. Whatever you do, just come. And Peter stood up and stepped out of the boat over the side. And he starts walking to him on the water. See? For that moment, the damaged wall was repaired. He went back to its origin. And now he was walking out his creation because God had created him to have dominion on earth. God had gifted him to rule and have dominion of this space. God had gifted him over the fish below and over the birds above. God had gifted him with the elements. Peter stepped out and he's walking in his original authority. I can see your sure just look at him and smile. See, because that immunizer <clears throat> stood up and he's firm. Nothing's wavering. And then something transpired. You know, I call it, I call it seeds like from a dandelion. You ever see a ripened dandelion? He gets that white head. I hate dandelions. I dislike them in my yard. And so I'm out there trying to, you know, you try to pop them out and you think, and they hardly have to get the root, you know, pop, and they break off so, so that the part that grows is still down there. And then, you know, your pops out, and it's not, you're not going to get one, you probably get two of them, because you know, it's, it's going to show you something. So you got to get down, you got to try to dig around, try to pull the whole thing out. So anyway, or you get, I try to, you know, in my mind, you're mumbling and stuff, you get your weeder out. And I go, and I go, you know, things walk around like this, and it can, get, it can go out and cut the ground and everything. I see that down line, I go, and it's fine, like, that down line will come right back up. So, but a deadline will come up, and once it gets ready for, to, to, to uh, pollinate, it gets the white head. And then the white head, when you pick it up, you're like this. And all these little things, little seeds of dandelions. What I call this was the enemy had placed a corrupted seed to corrupt the immuna. And the offshoots of it are now like dandelion seeds. See, he, he placed one key element, then all these little offshoots come out because it's like, he put this in there and just look, he picked up a thing go, and all these other little things popped out. Fear, doubt, worry, hurt, pain, lies, seeds. The immuna is corrupted and dandelion plant. Peter's out in the water, he's just walking in, in, his, in his creation. And all of a sudden, one of the little seeds pop in his mind. What? What? A little water splash, splash. I think I can probably see it. And all of a sudden, his eyes stop. For a moment, then he starts looking around to where he's at. And as I start looking around where he's at, that in your eye, that, that damage takes root again. And he starts to sink. He starts to sink. That's where this text picks up. And Yeshua said, look at him, he says, Yeshua, save me, save me. You know. And Yeshua just said, 
Yeshua reached out his hand immediately. Look how close he was. Now, Yeshua is an, is an elastic girl. He's not an elastic man. He's not reaching out to the door like this and saying, save me, he's not going, real long arm. He's there stretching. He's close enough to Yeshua. Because Yeshua, they said, Yeshua just reached out his hand and grabbed him. That's how close he got. He probably looked at him like this and Yeshua standing there. He probably got, started looking at Yeshua's eyes and stuff and seeing Yeshua's hair moving and everything else. And all of a sudden, he starts looking around and, and that's what this text picks up and says, Yeshua reached out his hand and took, him, took hold of him, saying, Oh, you of little immunah. Oh, you. You are doing so well. Oh, you of little immunah. Why did you doubt? Corrupted. Broken. <laughs> In our last study on uh, authority, we studied this. Again, your response to those walking in this immunized brokenness. When, remember when the centurion, we talked about this in depth. When he called Yeshua to come save his servant. And Yeshua has come. And the people had given him a great testimony. He's worthy of this. I know he's not, um, I know he, he's, he's a goim. He's a, he's, he's a Gentile. He's a Roman centurion. But he's worthy because he loves God's people. Again, I said, and I studied, we come back and say, no, he was, he wasn't just a, a Gentile. He was a believer. He was a goim. He was a, a semi-manonoi, they would call him. Because he was, he had gone through the full understanding of the, of the word. Only thing he hadn't done, he hadn't gone through circumcision. He's doing everything else. And, uh, so anyway, Yeshua was heading to his home. And then he said, before he got to the home, that's when the man looked up to him. I could probably see him. He probably thinking like he's, he's not probably just still functioning. He probably looked up and go. And then he could see him coming. So I said, whoa, whoa, whoa. Oh. Send the trumpet out. You don't have to come in the house. You just say the word. I'm not worried about you coming into that room. You just speak from, say the word. And actually, you're sure looking, stop and looking, and he says, hey, I'm a man. I'm a man under authority. I understand all this stuff. You don't have to come here. I just tell my servants to go. I tell this one to do that. They do it. Don't come in. They obey. I understand. I'm under authority. Speak the word, and he'll be healed. That's where this text picked up, and we love this. That's when Yeshua looked at him and said, and she heard him, and he was amazed. Dealing with the brokenness of the immunity, this man got it. He said, he turned to the crowd that was following him. He said, I tell you, I haven't seen such immunity intact as such like this in all Israel. Now this man understands the power. This man got an ignitement. This man is illuminated. This man's looking from God's original intent. He got it. Now all these examples I was telling you, as I'm showing, I'm saying there was something that's been innate, that's an errant, that's placed within us, that God calls immunity. It's a, it's a spirit of faith that's placed within us. Now, this is key. This is a key, pr key principle that's a part of this. Immunah, in its original origin, the seed that God placed within us, is not based on reason. Why? Why? Because reasoning is subject to change. Something that's innate, that's in you, that doesn't alter, is steadfast in, God, in the commands of God, this is not based on reasoning. Huh. Why? See, because in dialogue, a greater reasoning can always come along and prove your understanding, your reasoning wrong. Oh, that sounds good. Maybe I'll do, now, 
Now I believe it th on this side. Oh, I thought you believed. I did believe it until they disproved me and said this thing. So now this makes more sense than that. So I shift. And God trying to say, no. Your immuna is not based on reasoning. <laughs> Why are you putting so much emphasis on that? Because that thing I just talking about is where we find a lot of young kids, a lot of people going off to schools, getting out of different theologies, under teachers and structures and stuff, and having them turned all sideways because they're walking and they're questioning their very faith and understanding of their knowledge and get them in the whole scope of reasoning as to, and challenge what they believe. It's a damnable ideology that's set in our schooling today. This whole thought, and this is what they do in the streets. That's why I come, God says, don't get, don't, don't get in all this argument and, talk and dialogue about theologies and stuff. He says, that's just vain stuff. That's vain stuff. It's not profitable. See, when you're in your eye, when God placed that within the angels, when he placed it within man, when he placed it within his creation, God wasn't sitting there talking to them and trying to say, now this is why I put it here, this is what makes sense. So if you do it this way, this, and this, boom, spoke it and it is. That's why I say everyone has it. I was talking to a guy over, over, the, over the center, the rector where I was at, pastor, talking about his son has grown and raised in the faith. Just like he is. He's grown and raised and he's taught, teaching, taught him and everything. He said, send him off to school. He came back and now he doesn't know which way he's thinking. Turned upside down in his thought. Sitting in the, in, in the classroom, college classrooms and stuff. I've seen, uh, I have another pastor friend of mine. He's the pastor himself. He went there and he said he struggled when it kept coming at him and changing his talking. See, the enemy loved to get you in, a, in an atmosphere where he wants to challenge, like dandelion scenes, your very foundation of what you believe. And how? Immuna, what Peter has experienced on the water, is divine, is a restored divine intimacy. It's that knowledge of God, it's intimacy, it's, it's a oneness of who he is. True immuna is like experiencing an eyewitness, like you're an eyewitness to an event. So you can walk up and you can see an eyewitness, you're an eyewitness to something. For example, I can share with you about what God did to me in the hospital when my appendix ruptured. Now, you guys can give me all the reason you want to, but I don't think I said I, I know what he did. Carl, the same way. People can try to talk to you and try to reason you out of saying what transpired didn't happen. You may try and say, we, we, we can talk here until midnight. Now, I know it happened. Now, your understanding may be different from mine, but you cannot tell me that I wasn't there. I was there. I can look at Nita and I try and say, I think you're a wonderful woman, but you can't tell me you had a child. You know, you probably stop and say, what are you talking about? I said, the one, Melissa, I know, you probably adopted or acquired her. She kind of came in part of your family, but you didn't give her birth. You, you, you didn't raise this child. See, every mother's eyes are going to this. I think about what I've gone through in order to bring this child to play. You're going to try to convince me that I wasn't, I didn't do. No, you've got to be out of your mind. Now, you can tell me maybe those neighbors didn't do that, but don't, you can't come in here and tell me I didn't carry this child for nine months. And all the changes have gone through my body. And all the things, labor I went through. When I, when I went in the hospital and came out with this, you, you're trying to tell me this all didn't transpire? You know, especially even those ones who gave a cesarean. You know, they look back and say, what, what are you talking about? What, what, I, I don't understand. See, divine intimacy with God, when God puts it inside you, has nothing to do with reason. You're like an eyewitness. See, but see this, now this is the case. See, reasoning can help you get a better understanding of what you saw. 
but it'll never convince you that you didn't see it. We can talk about it, and we can expound. I can expound all day long, and you guys try to say, you know, I have a better understanding now what I went through. I did go through it, but now I have a better understanding. You know, <laughs> immunity is the low bearing wall that reasoning can't undo. I'll show you what I'm talking about. Another example. You remember that story over at John 9, 24 and 25, where the, where the man was, was blind, the man was, was blind from birth, and Yeshua made spittle, opened his eyes. See, now he was there. He was born that way. He was stayed in the temple. Yeshua walked up to him, opened his eyes. Now the leaders around him are going to question him and get him to understand, did that happen to you or not? Now they're going to try reason. Now we know you're sure that no man can open this man's eyes. Now are you sure he did this? Maybe you weren't born blind. Maybe and start going through all this stuff. Going through all this explanation as to, did it happen to you or not? Did you do it or not? I'm saying, and you're not, those, isn't, isn't, isn't flipping like this. So they, here again, they said, so they called him a second time. They called the man who had been blind. And they said to him, swear to God that you tell the truth. We know that this man is a sinner. And he's a sinner. He said, and he answered them, said this, whether he is a sinner or not, I don't know. Now, I don't understand all that. He said, but one thing I do know. <laughs> one thing I do know. I, I don't know all, your, all the theology. I don't know your reasoning. I don't know. I'm not here to argue about your doctorates and your insights and your, all your books and your studies. All that I do know is I was blind. And now I see. That is what it's like with the purity of the Emunah. It's not affected by the reason. It's, a, it's that you know that you know that you know something placed in your, in your, within you to your knower that you know. I like that story. So this study that God is going to take us in, the study of, on the surface of Emunah, this whole state is about to affirm the knowledge of this. That without God, it's impossible. Without faith, without immunah, Hebrews 11 and 6 says, without immunah, without faith, it's impossible to please him. So God has come back. That's what he's speaking to. That's what he's addressing. That's what he's coming to the core of. That's what, he's a, that's what he comes to restore. <laughs> he says, for whoever would draw near to God, must believe have immunity, that he exists and he rewards those who seek him. Hmm. See, we draw near to God by believing not only that he is, that he exists, but he is, and, God, and that he responds to us who diligently seek him. I love that part because in Hebrews, the fourth chapter, it kind of gives a, a clear definition of what he's saying here. In Hebrews, the fourth chapter, it says this. 4.16 says, Therefore let us confidently approach the throne from which God gives grace, so that we may receive mercy and find our grace in our time of need. I draw near because I, I, I come to that throne confidently. Why? Because he is. <laughs> he is. Now, let me, explain to me who he is. I don't understand what you mean. So, uh, all I know, I'm not going to go through all our dialogue. All I know is, he is. <laughs> so, Yeshua's kingdom mission was to repair the load bearing wall by undoing faulty reasoning. That was his call. That's what his mission. When he come down to the kingdom to tell, deal with us, to, to repair a wall that had been damaged. <laughs> and to undo faulty reasoning. What do you mean? What do you mean, faulty reasoning? Well, that's what the apostle John says. Over in John 20, 30 to 31, it says this. When you look at the book, he says, 
Now Yeshua, as he talks about the whole submission of all his writing and all that he did and all that he was about, Yochanan said this. He says, now Yeshua did many other miracles, did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not even written in this book. But these things are written so that you may believe that Yeshua is the Mashiach, the son of the living God, and that by believing in him, you may have life in his name. I'm trying to rekindle your immune now. I'm trying to establish your, your presence. This book and all that you have, all the stories that you read and all the testimonies that you see, everything we're talking about is all not just for the glory, just trying to produce movies and trying to tickle your feathers and get you all excited for bedtime stuff. No, I want you to understand one thing. All the writing, everything it's about, is that you might believe. You might get in power. Your immune now may be ignited and may you be restored to know that Yeshua is God. Amen? Amen? Amen. 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 Amen.